Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Amanda Cronkite, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies and an Associate Editor of the War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. What do the military and diplomats understand and misunderstand about each other? State and defense are both critical elements of national security, but within professional military education, what the State Department does and how it operates can be an enigma for some. So here's a few facts. The Foreign Service was established by Congress in 1924 and is organized based on the early 20th century naval rank and promotion system. Like military officers, FSOs, as they're called, have commissionings and are expected to serve anywhere in the world they might be needed. The American Foreign Service Association notes that there are about 8,000 Foreign Service generalists at the State Department stationed at 276 posts overseas. That is about half of the entire U.S. Foreign Service community, which also includes USAID, specialists in certain areas, and a few other small entities. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice often noted that there were as many members of military bands as there were Foreign Service officers. She wasn't off by much. A 2017 fact check noted that the military had about 6,500 active duty personnel in musical roles. With us today to help explain what the Foreign Service does, including in what people might think of as military environments and how state does so much with so few people, relative to the military at least, is a Foreign Service officer with over 21 years experience, Mr. Alex Abe Lalamont. He has served overseas in every one of the State Department's geographic bureaus, including multiple tours in Afghanistan. He is currently the Consular Section Chief in Harare, Zimbabwe. Thank you for joining us, Alex. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on with you. So there's a really popular meme out there. What my friends think I do, what my family thinks I do, what society thinks I do, what I actually do. So what does a Foreign Service officer do? Well, that's a good question. And I remember when that meme came out a few years ago and how much fun me and my my colleagues had with it. Um, you know, if you want to do a, a one second, one sentence version of what a foreign service officer does, a foreign service officer is a professional career diplomat who serves overseas and in Washington and in some cases, a few other uh, cities in the United States uh, and represents our country. So uh, the way that breaks down is it breaks down into several different functionalities. Um, but at its core, being a foreign service officer is public service is working for the American people, just like uh, colleagues in any other government agency. Okay. But how, for example, what does a foreign service officer do that, for example, someone from, if, if, if someone tells me they work for the Department of Energy, I probably can have an idea that either they're working with petroleum or gas or rockets. Um, if you had to, if you were going to explain to someone what, what your normal day or week was, what is it? Okay. Uh, well, I'll use my most recent current job as an example where I'm the consular section chief. So, so consular work is one of the five cones of, of foreign service work. Uh, cones are like, they might equate a little bit to an MOS uh, for our military colleagues or, or something like that. So uh, within the officer corps, there's consular, political, economic, public diplomacy, and management. So consular is, it's actually the oldest form of, of diplomacy. And our, the U.S. consular corps goes, goes way back to, to, the founding of the country, um, and that is looking after American citizens overseas. So providing routine services like uh, uh, passports, reports of birth, um, uh, notary services, to more specialized ones like visiting Americans in jail or helping Americans out in distress. Um, so that's half of it. And the other half is, uh, is right, it really has direct national security implications, and that's overseeing the vetting and, and uh, adjudication of all visas for every individual who needs to come to the United States for temporary purposes or for immigration. Um, so that's the consular functionality. The political and economic are reporting on political and economic developments in a host country. Uh, they'll do some advocacy with the host country, uh, what we call delivering demarches, which is official requests from one government to another. 
public diplomacy is public affairs, uh, cultural affairs. So like uh, Fulbright uh, is an exchange program that's run through the cultural affairs office of the American embassy in any given country. Uh, and then there's management, which is the provides the platform of service for, for the embassies to function. Everything from housing to motor pool to uh, human resources to anything in between. So those are kind of the five broad functionalities that uh, you have in the foreign service. Of course, it's a lot more, uh, you know, varied than that. But those are when you come in, you come in in one of those four, five functionalities. Uh, we also have specialists who, who they probably equate more to like warrant officers you might find in the, in the army or something like that, where they're, they're specialized in a particular field. So we have the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, for example, that, that is a federal law enforcement agency that does the security for all embassies overseas through what they call the regional security officer. We have IT specialists. We have all number of specialists that are really specialized in a particular field and not generalists like the officers are. And then, of course, in every embassy overseas, you have uh, probably at a two to one or three to one ratio to the Americans in the embassy, you have local staff that are, I might call them like the enlisted corps, uh, non-commissioned officers or, or enlisted men and women who who stay behind and are really the, the institutional knowledge in a lot of respects for the officers who are rotating through. Okay. So I, I appreciate your drawing the analogies to the military. I think that's very useful. What do you wish that the general public understood more about the Foreign Service? To the extent that, I mean, as you noted in your 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 kind of lead in there, um, we're not a large organization in terms of the Foreign Service, Foreign Service officers. We're, when you factor in all of the the staff that includes local staff and all that are employed in an embassy overseas, we number about 70,000. So that's not a small cabinet agency, but it's, it's, of course, compared to DOD, it's still tiny. But we're not, we're not necessarily as well known as some of the other government agencies. Um, and to the extent that people are aware of us, there's always this kind of the stereotype is the, the pinstripe, the, was it the pinstripe cookie pusher, right? The person who's wearing this pinstripe suit at receptions, who's, who's handing out canapes or hors d'oeuvres and, and meeting people in glad handing or something like that. Uh, that's kind of the, at one hand that glamorizes what we do a little bit. And the other hand, it kind of minimizes what we do a little bit. It's the, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different things we do. And, and, and when people ask, you know, uh, I like to say, again, we we're doing the work of the, we work for the American people. We do the work of the American people. We, we advance the American interest overseas and that's why we're there. And that is more than just being at receptions. It's all kinds of different things from, like I said, going to visit people in prison at, at two in the morning to in negotiating treaties that allow us to advance our national interest in that way. So if I were to say, you know, people say, well, what is it you do? And I have two minutes before they start turning out. That's what I would say. I say work overseas to advance the American interest. We work very hard. We're a very dedicated uh, and selectively hired group of people. And that's, you know, we're very mission focused. So that's, that's probably the, 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 if I had two minutes to explain that, that's how I would go about it. Okay. At the War College, we use the Gulf War as a case study for the students to think about the different elements of national power. And there's a story, and at this point, it's become a bit of a military urban legend, that after the Hundred Hours War, Schwarzkopf basically said, okay, where's state? They can take over now. Not realizing that there were no diplomats at that point anywhere near Kuwait. (laughs) who could have done the work for him. So what does state do in areas with a significant military presence or how do state and the military coordinate in your experience? Okay, well, I think that there are kind of two answers to that question. Let me first talk about more the traditional way we work with military and I'll focus first overseas and then I can talk a little bit about how it works in Washington maybe. And then we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of segue into to how it has worked over the last 15 to 20 years with respect to, to being downrange. So to begin with, like every, and, and let's also, by the way, I, I know you mentioned it earlier, but let's, ex- remember, let's also not fail to point out that um, USAID is also part of the Foreign Service, because when we're talking about, and, and I get to that a little further down, when I talk about kind of being forward deployed or whatever, you'll have USAID people and Foreign Agriculture Service people as well. So that's important to remember, too. They are also elements of the Foreign Service in those agencies. But to back it back up, like when you're in an embassy, like every every Foreign Service person that goes to an embassy is going to be somewhat familiar with the military, if nothing else, because there are Marine security guards at pretty much every embassy. Now, that's a small detachment that's usually led by a staff sergeant, Marine staff sergeant, or, or Marine gunnery sergeant. 
um, not an officer or, or such. So there will be some contact. And of course, pretty much every embassy has a defense attache and, and in many cases, an office of defense cooperation that will be staffed by some kind of field grade officer, um, in large cases, maybe a general officer. So there's some familiarity, but really the ratio is still broadly in the favor of the civilians in terms of, of staffing. So you'll, you know, there'll be 70 American direct hire staff and five or six of them might be in the, you know, the senior defense uh, uh, officer and his or her staff. Um, you get back to Washington, there's a lot of interagency coordination that goes on. Every, every geographic bureau at the State Department, so the bureaus that cover, um, we slice the world up into several different categories uh, by region, and those all will have um, military liaisons working in there, usually in their regional security policy offices. Um, and then we have a Bureau of Pole Mill Affairs at Maine State as well that that handles a lot of those things. So that's and that's a long standing and a, a long existing relationship. But what is relatively recent? Uh, well, I mean, it happened in Vietnam as well. But uh, but, you know, since 9-11, what you had was then diplomats and development professionals uh, situated downrange in austere combat environments with active duty military personnel who then the ratio is completely flipped on its head. Like when I was, I spent two years as a political advisor based at Bagram Airfield from 12 to 14, working with uh, the army division commands that were there. Um, and the ratio is probably 12 to one uh, green suitors to us. And of course there's of civilians then in a place like that, there's a lot of contractors. So first they're kind of like, they don't know if you're a contractor or not because you're not wearing a you know, military uniform like that. So yeah, establish a little bit what you do. And so in that situation where, where you find, you know, like, again, when you work in an embassies, a lot of the people you're working with on the military side are foreign area officers who, who are basically the military's diplomats. So who are a bit more indoctrinated into our ways of working and our corporate culture and all that. Um, you get the other way around and suddenly, you know, that we're on their territory as it were, and we have to adapt a little bit to that that corporate culture. Um, and the way that worked, uh, and, and, you know, those days, there's not as much of that happening now, but it's still happening in lots of places around the world. Um, for example, in Afghanistan, and I'll, I'll draw mostly on my experience in Afghanistan because it, I don't, I wasn't in Iraq or in other places where we might be working together, but you had provincial reconstruction teams in some places you had district reconstruction teams or district support teams, I should say, and they would have people under chief admission authority. So under the ambassador's authority based out of Kabul, um, and you'd have a mix, you'd have state department, you'd have USAID and usually some foreign agriculture service people too. Not always foreign service officers, sometimes brought on like a five-year limited non-career appointment, um, but often foreign service officers as well. Um, and then they're working, you know, from my perspective, they had like, you had like two different roles. One was to do diplomacy, to work with your foreign counterparts and your host government counterparts as we do all over the world. And to provide them advice and, and, and guidance on, on how to, to, in the case of Afghanistan, for example, kind of really rebuild their country after, you know, war that started in 79, I believe, you know, decades of war. But then you also had to work internally to develop relationships with the military counterparts, because invariably, uh, if you wanted to go somewhere, you needed, you know, MRAPs or helicopters and, and security. And all that came from the military in most cases when you're out in the, in the field. Um, and so uh, you had, you know, you had, uh, you had two different kinds of interpersonal relationships or two different kinds of diplomacy to practice, like your external diplomacy and your internal diplomacy. And you had to develop relations with both sides. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, as I alluded to earlier, like, I look at, you know, as I was preparing kind of for this discussion, I was thinking about where are we similar and where are we different? And I think the first thing is you, you alluded to the person, the pay system that we, we cribbed from the Navy. And so we do have that rank in person system and we do have a competitive promotion system. It's not quite engineered the same way the, the armies is in that if you, if you miss your primary zone as you're, you know, if you're an America, an army officer, you, you're basically out. It's very rare that you don't get promoted uh, or will get promoted if you miss your primary zone. But, you know, here in the, in the foreign service, you have a certain number of years in class. And um, if you don't get promoted in that period of time, you get dumped out. So, and it does happen, uh, you know, it does happen. So we do have a similar kind of promotion system. And then we also, like I alluded to earlier, we're we are very mission focused um, in the same manner in some respects that the military is. It, it may come across a little bit differently. We may, 
use different terms when discussing it, but, but, you know, foreign service officers are by and large, very mission driven, um, very service oriented, um, and really hardworking. So you, you do have some similarities there. Um, I think the, the differences that I had to kind of negotiate were first and foremost in how much more direct and directive the military is. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things that you could be a lot more direct with military colleagues than you can with, with state department colleagues and how much less comfortable with ambiguity the military really is. Whereas we're very comfortable we're, we deal ambiguity all the time. Um, you know, military is all about achieving discrete and defined objectives. And sometimes to paraphrase what one of our presidents said about economists, like you only wish you had a foreign, you, you could find foreign service officer only had two hands, you know, like on the one hand and on the other hand and on the third hand, um, and so those are kind of gaps you got to bridge. Uh, and, you know, some, sometimes that, that works and sometimes it doesn't. I like to think uh, by and large it works, but sometimes, you know, like when you've got that kind of that intense environment, you got, you got tension and, and people handle it better or, better or worse. And we had to deal with the fallout from when it didn't work as well. Do, can you think of any particular interactions with the military in your 20 years that stand out that you think that might highlight how state and defense work well together? My sense is that, especially if we're talking about like uniform military and not necessarily the the political leadership of either organization, but the uniform military and the rank and file diplomats, I think we, one thing I noticed, like when I, I sat down, I was working with, the, um, I sat in two different locations when I was at Bagram. I sat in the CJ9, the civil affairs shop. And I also had an office in the, the senior civilian reps office, which is like our equivalent of the, the division commander. Um, and at the time we had 260 chief of mission people in the field uh, in the eastern part of Afghanistan. Of course, there was a, a division plus. There were like five or six brigade combat teams in, in the same area in terms of military size. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, obviously, again, the ratio is way skewed in front of our, our military colleagues. Um, but I noticed I was sitting in the civil affairs shop and a new group of civil affairs guys ripped in and I hadn't been there that long and I had, was still kind of learning my, my way around, but I got to know these people really well. And I, I appreciated a couple of things. One is that, um, they had an understanding of what the limitations of bureaucracy were. That was pretty similar to ours. And that sounds kind of weird, but maybe at first, you know, it's easy to come in and, and just feel like, you know we can do whatever we want, you know, the pies, the sky's the limit, you know, whatever. Uh, but there are limitations both based in reality and based on what our bureaucracies will do. And we both had come from large, fairly impersonal bureaucracies that made achieving things quickly, somewhat difficult just by their, just the bureaucratic inertia. And, and they, they understood really well the limitations of that as well as we did. And so you, you didn't have because at this time in Afghanistan, it was kind of the winding down at the end of the surge. And there were still a lot of good idea fairies kind of sprouting around and people like, hey, what if we try this? And you would say, well, hold on. Before we try that, let's go look like two years ago, see if we tried it then. Oh, we did. And what happened? Oh, it failed. OK, so let's before we commit, you know, so so these guys came in and they, they some of them had probably been through the, the, you know, the AOR before and all that. And they kind of understood the limitations of the good idea fairy in a good way. Like so we weren't spinning up. And wasting time being spun up trying to do stuff that that was not going to work or had tried been tried before and and whatever so that, that was good just i know it's not a specific example but that mindset it was really useful i think we did a when we could and and i should also say some of the commanders that that cycled through at the time some of them were still at very senior levels in the military had been deployed in in eastern afghanistan before and so they had that same kind of I want to say in a good way, world weariness, like understanding of, of what's feasible and possible. Um, and so when we said when, for example, in the first round of elections in 2014, we said like our vision is that we know that we can provide support to the Afghans so they can deliver and retrograde all their ballots. But we also know that if we take our foot off the gas, they can probably do it too, because they've assessed that it's a priority. And so we got the, the regional command East leadership on board with that. And we were able to hold off all these like do-gooding, you know, attempts to valiantly help the Afghans and not let them fail by providing airlift support or whatever. And it worked. It's one of the things I'm really happy we managed to accomplish because we were in sync with our, our military colleagues or, you know, is it mostly army people there? Um, and the Afghans were able, I mean, there's pictures of them taking 
ballots back from Nuristan on donkeys, but it worked. And it was a local solution that didn't involve us throwing a lot of money at it. And, you know, we agreed, for example, at that point, and, and you can read about a lot of this in the Washington Post, the special investigator, inspector general for Afghan reconstruction put out a report that um, had been putting out a series of reports, but got reported on in the Washington Post about a year ago. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were talking about it at the time where, where the money was going and how much, you know, concern there was about the money that was being spent. And we both, our side and the military side, agreed that the this SERP fund, the Commander's Emergency Response Program funding, was was had already kind of saturated the area. So we agreed to not use it um, because there's already enough money flowing around there that, you know, that had a hard time tabulating and keeping track of it. And it was kind of beyond its useful service life. And so we were able to hold that off. And that allowed, you know, at some levels and in some respects, it allowed the Afghans to start having to make funding decisions using somewhat more limited resources, which is really an important kind of bureaucratic exercise. Like how do we come to a consensus about how to spend limited resources? Because then you have to really articulate the priorities and that's quite important. So, so there's a couple of good examples, I think, um, that are a bit more specific, but uh, the general speaking is when, when you align, you know, and instead of trying to find a good next good idea fairy, that's just going to magically fix everything. You take a more realistic approach. And when you could bu- get your military colleagues or to buy into that approach or vice versa, then, then we tended to be a lot more effective at, you know, using the tools of state to gradually bend the curve in the right direction. So I want to turn back to what you said about consular work and helping Americans. And obviously, 2020 and 2021 have been very difficult years for the entire world. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how consular officers have been helping uh, both American citizens with the pandemic and how diplomacy has been during the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's actually a great success story, an example of what the Foreign Service, and and it it starts with a consular corps, but it's not only like other people, you know, it's not exclusive to consular work, but but is largely spearheaded by consular work and what that's been able to do for Americans. Uh, You know, when the the pandemic started, you know, a lot of things, a lot of countries started closing and lockdowns started happening really quick. And embassies all over the world started realizing the need to to repatriate Americans back to the United States so they could hunker down, they could have access to better medical care, they could be safer. Um, And so that's a pretty immense undertaking and and at no small risk to to the officers and, and the staff themselves that were we're working on it. So, I mean, around, and, and it, again, it wasn't just consular work. The, the, the Bureau of Medical Affairs back in Washington um, was involved. The, the, the logistics planners in our Bureau of Management were involved um, and organized a whole bunch of charter flights worldwide to repatriate Americans back to the United States. Uh, when I was in Kabul, I was actually not working in, in the consular section at that time. I didn't have a consular commission or anything like that. I was working on something else. And I was still drafted in to help out uh, repatriate people from Kabul. So we went to the Kabul airport with our N95 masks and just completely kitted out in as much, you know, protective gear as we could, could manage. And we loaded up about a third of a plane. It was a charter plane that was stopping in a bunch of different locations. And a third of it, I think was allocated to Kabul. And we filled it with hundreds of Americans and also green card holders, by the way, um, and shipped them back to the United States so they could, they could be there. Uh, so that's just off the top. That's one, I think, really great success story. And in, in, again, difficult times that we were able to do that and keep our own people pretty safe. You know, and we're still doing it with respect to to right now. Like we're not repatriating people en masse, but we've had to cut down a lot of consular services, uh, specifically the visa services I was referring to, um, in order to to minimize the exposure people have coming into the embassy, coming out. And also because up until fairly recently, there were a few presidential proclamations that limited who could travel the United States and how they could route themselves uh, in order to keep down um, the number of people with COVID coming into the United States. And yet, in spite of that, we still are out there uh, taking care of Americans as best we can um, within those limitations and providing services. And, and th- that always remains our, our top priority. Uh, insofar as the, you know, what we do for, for any embassy in the world is, you know, taking care of Americans overseas. And so we're still doing that a whole lot. I think pivoting to, to larger diplomatic efforts, um, you know, now the big thing is, is vaccine diplomacy and our government has pledged up to $4 billion to this COVAX program to, through the WHO to, to help people around the world get vaccines. 
Um, and, and, you know, a lot of world, a lot of countries in the world specifically, and just to give an example here in Zimbabwe, we provide a lot of assistance, uh, to the healthcare sector. Um, now that's traditionally not earmarked for COVID, but for things like malaria and HIV and stuff like that. But when you're building healthcare infrastructure, you're building healthcare infrastructure and it can be used for multiple purposes. Likewise in Afghanistan, where I just came from, same deal. We basically helped build the country's healthcare infrastructure from scratch. Um, and to the extent that it is able to address people with COVID, um, it's largely due to a lot of the assistance we provide. What would you tell a young person thinking about a career in public service? If you could talk to yourself, you know, before you took the foreign service exam or when you were in high school or college debating the foreign service or the military, what would you tell someone thinking about a, about taking on the public sector job? I, I would say do it. Um, I, I mean, everyone's different. Um, but I, I think in my personal opinion, we spend a lot of time in, in, in our discourse as a citizenship, as a citizenry in the United States, demeaning public service. And it's easy to blame the government for this or the government for that. Uh, and and I, I'll just say when I joined the Foreign Service and I was in my 100 class, I was just really struck with how sharp everyone was, how dedicated everyone was. Um, and that continues to be the case. I mean, you, you certainly meet duds, but by and large, the people you meet are, are driven and highly dedicated people. And, and I, I found this also when I was working again at Bagram with the, you know, two-star general all down and, and the division staff and all that, um, those, you know, the, and their command sergeants major and their senior enlisted people and all the people were really driven, hardworking people that were really trying to do the right thing for our country. And so I would say first, and I actually have said this, I do, you know, outreach and talks with student groups and stuff like that. I say, don't, when you hear people demeaning the government, think, think twice about what they're saying. I mean, public service is an important and an honorable vocation. And I stand by that for all the good and the bad and all the successes and failures. Um, you know, I was just in a leadership training course, actually, and a former, uh, our class mentor was a former assistant secretary of state, uh, Maura Hardy, Ambassador Maura Hardy. And she said, you know, you could wake up, let's say you work for a corporation or whatever. Um, every morning you wake up, you know, you're basically thinking how well you're going to do your job so you can make someone else some billionaire richer, or you could wake up and think about, um, how, uh, how you can advance the American interest and, and serve a mission and serve a purpose. Well, thank you, Mr. Ave Lalamat for joining us today on a better piece. Listeners, as Alex mentioned, the Foreign Service is very selective. If you would like to learn more about the Foreign Service exam, the State Department website can tell you about that. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and send us suggestions for future programs. And rate and review this podcast on your podcaster of choice, which helps others to find us. We're always interested in hearing from you. Until next time, from the War Room, I'm Amanda Cronkite. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.